In crazy times, I, I find just this incredibly deep-rooting uh, confidence. And I'm, I was reminded of it this morning as we sang together, especially in this last song. In, in the chaos of the world, uh, in the uncertainty uh, of even our, our own nation and the direction that it will go over the coming months, um, there is one who is above and beyond all of it, who is not affected by it. Uh, and, and it brings me great peace, and I, I'm so grateful for it. This morning, as we continue our Summer You Asked For It series, uh, it, is, it is that majesty, that greatness, that authority and power uh, that I, I find comfort in, because the question today is a doozy, and it's one that probably I would have skipped and picked something else, except uh, you, you all are getting craftier and how you submit your requests and your questions. This one was written, my 10-year-old granddaughter asked, and I'm like, oh, yeah, now we have to do it for the children. <laughs> I love it. You guys are good. Uh, my 10-year-old granddaughter asked, when do we go to heaven? Immediately after we die or when Jesus returns? What a great question. Uh, it is... It's a doozy, though, because a question like that, you answer, and somehow in answering the question, you raise a dozen other questions, right? And uh, so I will tell you this morning, we're going to tackle it. We will not probably fully answer it and effectively answer it, because as you're taking notes this morning, you'll probably think of a hundred other questions that go along with this one. And uh, we got 30 minutes, so... What are you going to do in 30 minutes, right? But some of these other questions that also arise with what happens after we die, uh, is there some sort of intermediate state, right? Like, is there a heavenly waiting room that I go to for a while? Uh, or do I go directly to heaven or to hell if I don't know, don't love Christ? Where do we go? How long are we there? Are we aware of it while we're there? Or are we just like sleeping it away like on a long road trip where you wake up and all of a sudden it's time to have fun? Uh, or like how does this all work? Is it pleasant or unpleasant? We have terms and, uh, and theological treatises and theories about what happens. We, we know about uh, t phrases and terms and expressions like purgatory or soul sleep, and, and that raises more questions. Theologians that have gone before us have tried to, to fill in the blanks. You know, the scriptures tell us some things, uh, but it, again, raises other questions, and so we try to discern and fill in the gaps with our own thinking and our own wisdom. So there's a lot here. There's a ton for us to talk about. And as I mentioned, it, it, it is probably impossible for us truly to answer all the questions, but I do want to encourage you this morning with a few core truths that we know for certain from the Scriptures. And so let's do that. First and foremost, you need to understand that your soul is, is that which lives on forever. So while this life is limited and only lasts for a, a certain number of days or years, this is not the end. The good news is death isn't fatal. Somehow. <laughs> right? Death is not the end. When you take your last breath, your existence is not over. There is more to come. Your soul, your, your spirit will live on forever. Paul says to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Good news. If the earthly tent, and, and it does feel like that, doesn't it? Probably not if you're 20, maybe not if you're 30, perhaps a little bit by the time you're 40, most definitely evidence of it by the time you're 50. Pastor Jim Canole 
passed away several years ago, was a long time member and attender of this church. He used to walk in on Sunday mornings and he would say to me, most weeks, I'd say, Jim, how you doing? And he'd say, oh, Josh, getting old ain't for sissies. You know, Jim had been in a, a pretty significant accident early in his life when he was a missionary in Japan. He had shattered his two legs after a, a huge fall of, of well over 60 feet. And so he hobbled in on his legs that had been reconstructed and put several decades after that. They were sore, uh, they ached and hurt, they were not the same length, and he walked in every Sunday ready to go. And he kept up with his kids and his grandkids, and he loved Jesus, and he had lunch with friends, and he invited people over for Bible study. And uh, when I'd ask him, he always had a great week, but he always was also truthful. Getting old ain't for sissies. The, the tent that he uh, lived in for a good long time, over 90 years, was wearing out. And he felt the, the full weight of that. Each of us will come to that point. The tent we live in is only temporary. But the Bible tells us that it's not the end. Death, of course, isn't fatal. Paul also said to the Corinthian church in his first letter to them in chapter 15, we're actually going to spend quite a bit of time in 1 Corinthians 15 today. If you have lots of questions about death and what happens and how life looks after your last breath, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the chapter for you. It talks uh, about the resurrected Christ. It talks about our uh, resurrection and our resurrected bodies. It's not all there is in the scriptures, but it's a great place to start. Paul says in chapter 15, if there is a natural body, we know that to be true, right? We can see them. Uh, we can touch them. There is also a spiritual body. If the first is true, then the second is also true. If there is a natural body, I have one, right? Uh, we, we abused some of the natural bodies this last week at cowboy games. A bunch of men showed up uh, out at Pro Edge Arena and played all kinds of games. In fact, played Hot Shot Bible Trivia, which is Bible trivia with a cow prod. And uh, it was great fun. It was a good time. Uh, but I already had somebody walk in this morning and say, look at this, and showed me rope burns from cowboy jousting. So uh, we have natural bodies. We know that because we can injure them. And if you're guys, you can appreciate when your friends injure them and you find great enjoyment in it. If there is a natural body, the promise is from Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, there is also a spiritual body. But there is a... There is a sobering truth about this natural body. It is unable to inherit or to enter into that which is eternal, that which is permanent. Your physical body isn't made for the spiritual realm. realm. It is not capable of living permanently. It is finite. It's disposable to some degree, right? Your soul, however, remains alive and aware and conscious, and it interacts with the God of the universe. If we read on in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes on to say, I declare to you, Paul, Paul didn't lack for confidence. As you read through his letters, he was bold, and he often made declarative statements. This is one of those. This is one of those spaces where Paul says, I can promise you this. We can take it to the bank. I declare to you with 100% confidence, Paul says, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He is speaking to a crowd of people that had been watching for and expecting Messiah for thousands of years. They anticipated that when Messiah came, he would overthrow whatever government had oppressed them. It had been the Egyptians, it had been the Assyrians, it had been the Babylonians, it had been the Greeks, it was now the Romans. And they expected that Messiah would overthrow whatever bully was beating up on them at the time. And that Messiah would establish a political kingdom, a physical kingdom with its, its capital in Jerusalem. 
and that the world would experience peace. We've talked about this over the last couple weeks. And Paul corrects it for the Corinthian church. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. I, I went to mow my lawn this weekend, and I noticed sitting beside the driveway was a small grocery sack. And I didn't know what was in it, but I knew I didn't want to open it because it had been sitting there for several days in the heat. I, upon investigation, found out that someone had purchased a bunch of peaches a couple weeks ago and left them in the car that my son drives. And nobody knew about it until Grant figured it out several days later when he went out to get in his car and thought, what is that horrid smell? Uh, And so he looked to figure out what that was three or four days after that, because that seems to make the most sense. Uh, And when he figured out what it was, it was these rotting peaches under the back seat, he took care of them by just throwing them next to the car. So then several days after that, when I discovered them, uh, I got to take care of them. Perishable items don't do well over time. Your body is perishable. At some point, uh, it will stop functioning, and then shortly thereafter, uh, it will stinketh and it will begin to rot, right? We all know that. The perishable cannot inherit that which is imperishable. That which is temporary cannot sustain itself, cannot exist uh, forever within a, a world, a realm, a spiritual world that is imperishable. that that we were ultimately made for. He goes on in verses 53 and 54 to say, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. That which is temporary must put on that which is imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. You know, from this side of the grave, (coughs) death feels like a pretty scary, permanent thing that comes for all of us. We often view death as that which we avoid and run from, for many years, and eventually it catches us, right? Like the gazelle that grows weary in front of the leopard or the cheetah, eventually death catches up to us. We can't outrun it forever. Hundreds of horror movies have been written about it, and eventually death captures us and devours us, and our body ceases to exist. But the Bible tells us a different story. The Bible tells us that death is that which is ultimately swallowed up in victory. And while what is perishable, our bodies, ceases to exist, that which has been created imperishable, your soul, your spirit, lives on forever and is actually victorious over death. Just as death thinks it's got its claws and in you and its jaws, Victory comes and swallows up death. And in that moment, we are victorious. And this reality, friends, ought to, ought to change everything we think and feel and how we approach both life and death itself. Death is not the end. Death isn't fatal. In fact, it's, it's just the entry into what we were ultimately created for. And that's the second promise. Everyone, every single person is resurrected. Both wicked and good experience resurrection. Everyone is resurrected to a body that is an upgrade from this one, that is greater than this one, <coughs> than this one. A body which has greater abilities, greater sensitivities, which experiences creation to a fuller extent, is more knowledgeable and aware of God's created 
higher order than we experience now. You will understand more. You will experience more in your next body than you do in this one. It is an upgrade. It is much more complex than what we are capable of now. As brilliant as we have been created, as beautifully as we have been crafted, we are nothing compared to that which we will be. What comes after this physical life is of a greater magnitude. Paul appeared before the Roman governor Felix. <clears throat> uh, the Jewish leaders at the time were uh, accusing Paul of being a heretic, of abandoning the, Ju the traditional Jewish teaching, that which had been accepted for thousands of years. And Paul before Felix in Acts chapter 24 says, However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. They, they say it is a departure of traditional Judaism. Paul goes on to say, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and what is written in the prophets. He, I hold to the scriptures, Paul says. Verse 15, And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the, un, and the wicked. Paul says that both the righteous and the wicked are resurrected, that, that eternal life is not just for those who are found righteous before God, but that every human being experiences eternity somehow. There's a list, a new list of questions that starts to arise, isn't there? Everyone is resurrected. The prophet Daniel says in chapter 12, verse 2, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Again, everyone resurrects. Some to life and some to contempt or shame. And in John chapter 5, Jesus also talked about eternity and about every person, every human being has been created with a soul and those individuals, all of us, will be raised from the grave either to everlasting life or everlasting condemnation. Every person experiences eternity. Paul described it for those of us who, who need word pictures like a seed. I, I love the way Paul talks about it in, again, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, Some will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish, he says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Which at first read seems unfamiliar and strange, but then he explains it this way. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. Think about all of the crops that are flourishing and growing in southern Michigan right now. The corn is now above my head, which I know isn't saying a whole lot, but it's getting taller by the day. With all the rain and the heat, it's growing very quickly. The beans are getting full and thick and lush. Most of the wheat is, has been or is being cut right now. We, we see the grain being ripened and filling out, but we didn't plant it that way, did we? It, we don't see farmers out there digging a little hole and dropping a corn stalk in it in the spring and then moving over in another hole and another corn stalk in it. They fill their hoppers with millions of tiny grains, whether it's wheat or barley or beans or corn or, or whatever else. They drop a simple little seed in the ground. And Paul says, life for us is the same. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. Your body is just a seed. It contains valuable information. It has the essence, the kernel of who you truly are, but it's not what you will become. What you'll become is much more. <clears throat> 
It's just a seed, perhaps of weed or of something else, but God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. Here he makes a distinction. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of a flesh and animals another, birds and another and, and fish another. He says then, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. And then he goes on a little further, verses 42 to 44. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, the body that we put into the ground that is temporary, disposable, perishable, It is raised imperishable. When you are raised in your new body, your new resurrected body, it will be imperishable. It is without end. It goes on forever. 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body but it is raised a spiritual body. This body. Some, some of them pretty incredible. Accomplishing unbelievable feats in this life is still just a simple seed. A humble seed that will last for a while. It will be placed in the ground the outer shell will fall away and dissolve and disintegrate. And out of it will come something new and beautiful and more extravagant and complex than you could ever imagine from looking at the seed itself. The resurrected body is better. We see evidence of this in Jesus' life after his own resurrection. We don't know a lot about the resurrected body, but we know that Jesus, the first and only to have been resurrected to date, came out of the grave with a body that was doing things that it couldn't do before. It appeared to the disciples out of nowhere. It moved through walls or a locked door of some sort at one point. It still maintained its recognizability When Jesus appeared to the disciples, they knew who he was, even though Thomas doubted and thought, how can this possibly be? There's no way it can be Jesus. Jesus held out his hands and said, examine the scars that he still had from his crucifixion. His hands and his side still bore the wounds of his excruciating death. So, The resurrected body is an upgrade. It is much better. And yet it's still recognizable. And Paul tells us here in 1 Corinthians that it is imperishable. It exists without end. It is everlasting. I might make a a quick note here that, that Jesus is, again, the only person to have ever been resurrected. And I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, there's a few accounts in the New Testament of other resurrections. I can think of Jairus' daughter and Lazarus and and a couple other people who died and, and came back to life. I would argue those were resuscitations, not resurrections. You see, Jesus, because of his power over sin and death, was able to reanimate those bodies. He was able to breathe life and put life back into them that they might continue living, but they didn't have the resurrected, glorified, imperishable imperishable body. Those bodies, again, wore out for another time. Each of those individuals had the distinct pleasure of dying twice, of physical death. So I would say they were resuscitations. Many of you know a person whose heart has stopped, whose perhaps even mind has stopped functioning for moments and been resuscitated. I'm sure you are grateful for those moments and the years that follow. 
Those are resuscitations. What, what is restored to you is not an eternal body with supernatural abilities. It's the, it's the same body, same temporary body. It is not glorified as of yet. Resurrection happens with each and every person. The Bible tells us, the prophets tell us, Jesus told us, Paul explains it here in 1 Corinthians, that every single person is resurrected into eternity. Their soul is given some sort of body. We, we can't explain all of it. We don't fully understand what that body looks like. We just know it's better than this one. And so if every person then is resurrected into eternity, what happens with them? The Bible also gives us some indication of that as well. We are told in the scriptures that each of us will spend eternity in one of two conditions. Either fully in the presence of God himself or fully excluded from that presence. Now, there are lots of ways to describe what that might be like. But those are the two options. You are either within God's presence, or you are completely separated from it. And the Bible tells us who and what God is. He is life. He is light. He is love. He is comfort and peace. And so in his presence, you would experience those things in their fullness because he's the source of them. But if you are out of God's presence, you will experience eternity without that which comes with his presence, without love, without peace, without comfort, without hope. You see, we have a choice. And in this life, you live indicating what, what the desire of your soul is, what the desire of your heart is. By the, by the things that we do and the, the things that we set our lives to, the efforts that we give, the conversations that we have, the things that we're passionate about, the things we give our time to, they indicate whether or not we desire to be in the presence of God and that which he offers us, or if we resist all of those things, if we, if we push against peace in our relationships, if we are antagonistic against love, true unconditional love, and, and all of the rest of them. It does, does your soul long for that which only God provides because of what he is? Or do you push against it? Do you resist it and walk away from it? Resurrection does happen. Eternity happens for each person. Life will continue. Your soul will shed this temporary body and eventually be given another body. And you will exist. Your soul, your understanding conscious. Your will and desire, all that it makes up who you are at your core, will continue on, will live on, will exist on, and your eternity begins immediately. The soul and the spirit will experience eternity the moment, will continue experience the moment your body stops living. And we see lots of evidence toward this in the scriptures. Probably the, the one that people go to most often is recorded in Luke chapter 23 at Jesus' crucifixion when the thief hanging next to him asks Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. This thief asking another individual who is being massacred and executed publicly recognizes Jesus as Messiah and King. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say to him? He says to him in verses 42 and 43, he said, Jesus answered him in verse 43, Truly, I tell you, 
today you will be with me in paradise. And I've heard this, I've heard this statement, this response of Jesus explained lots and lots of ways. What did Jesus mean by today? Well, the original expression, the original phrase means this day. This very day, the one you and I are experiencing right now, speaking to the thief, on this day, you will be with me in paradise. Well, what is paradise? Is this another one of those kind of temporary places where the, the righteous go until Jesus sorts it all out and, and makes everything work? The same word paradise is used elsewhere in the scriptures. It's used in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. When Jesus tells the thief that he will be in paradise, he's speaking of the eternal heavenly garden where the tree of life exists. You remember the tree of life from Genesis. The, the tree that Adam and Eve were restricted from. After they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, angels were placed to guard them from being able to partake also of the tree of life. It is God's sanctuary, which is his perfect garden, paradise. Jesus told the thief, in, in just a few hours, this day, you will be in paradise with me, Jesus said. There's no way to explain it away. The, the thief, when he breathed his last, entered into heaven, into paradise with Christ. <clears throat> Again, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, Therefore, to the Corinthians who had hundreds of questions, therefore we are always confident and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For if we live by faith, not by sight, then Paul says we are confident. I say and, and would rather prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Paul said, I tolerate this life. I tolerate this limited physical body. And we know that Paul's body had been abused and beaten and shipwrecked and all the rest of it. No wonder he was ready to be done with it all. Probably a lot like Pastor Jim. Experienced all kinds of soreness and aches and pains and struggles. Paul said, I would prefer to be away from this body and to be at home with the Lord. Jesus promised immediate paradise to the thief. Paul says, I know that the moment I'm done and I discard this body, I will be with the Lord for eternity. And somehow, somehow God promised this to the thief. Jesus promised to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. And yet, as we read the scriptural account, Christ took his last breath descended into Hades or hell, preached to the souls there, was in the grave for three days, was resurrected, walked the earth for another 50 days before he ascended into heaven. How is that all possible? I think there are a couple explanations. One, God, Jesus, in his resurrected state, in his spiritual state, when he discarded his human body, was still God. He's still omnipresent. He alone could be in Hades preaching to the souls there and in heaven in paradise with the thief and the Father and the Spirit. I also think we, we think of the spiritual realm in human physical terms limited by the passage of time. And yet when we read about Eternity. When we read about the spiritual world in the scriptures, we see one that, that doesn't seem to be constricted by time the way that we are. 
2 Peter 3.8 says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. They're kind of all the same, Peter says. You see, in the spiritual realm, when we don't live on a linear timeline that only marches one direction forward in time, in the spiritual realm, we aren't tied to the ticking of the clock. One second, one minute, one hour, one day, one week after another. You see, with God, a, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. We, and our spirits don't have to wait for decades or centuries or millennia for God's plan to play out. Purgatory and soul sleep and all of these other terms are, are man-made institutions. They're, they're terms to describe mysteries that we can't fully understand. We've never, you and I have never lived outside of time. And so it's hard for us, it's difficult, it's impossible for us to fully understand what that might be like. But I believe the, the scriptures indicate in several places that when we take our last breath, eternity does begin immediately and time is no longer an issue for us. And so whether you die one nanosecond before Christ's return or 10,000 years before his return, when you die, your spirit and your soul are in his presence or away from it. And at some point, a day, a thousand years, it's all the same in eternity, you'll be upgraded with a new body the likes of which we've never seen or experienced before. It's been described in the life of Jesus a little bit, but not much. And so we trust him for it. There is much we don't know and don't understand and probably couldn't comprehend if it was explained to us. Because this world is limited, our bodies are limited, our understanding and knowledge is limited. But someday we will see in full that which we were ultimately created for. And we're invited into in the life, the death, and the resurrection of his son. Father, our souls have been created for your presence. We know this. We recognize that this body, this temporary shell, this tent, as Paul calls it, it is temporary. It will cease and Father, we await and we trust you for the body that is to come. Lord, we recognize our tendency to stray away from you. And we ask you for our forgiveness today. While this body is temporary, our souls were meant for your presence for all of eternity. You offered us peace through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask today, as we recognize our own rebellion that we would have hearts and minds that long for you like nothing else. That we would recognize our rebellion against you. We would see where we falter, where we walk away, where we are easily tempted to, to be drawn from you, God. And we, we confess our sin before you. We ask you for your forgiveness offered through your son, Jesus. The first, the first fruits of the resurrected. And God, we ask that you would receive us into your eternal presence. May we never be found away from you in spirit. Hold us in your loving kindness, in your good grace, and in the security of your power over our sin and the death which pursues us. May it only be physical death, and may we never be cast away from you for eternity. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.
mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in
a buried body begin to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me come on then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body 